Hey, what's going on, everybody? And welcome back to Contact Industries podcast channel. This is Complacency Kills. Um, for this next episode is uh, near and dear to our hearts and uh, should be to yours as well. And I know as of right now, you see some unfamiliar faces considering this is episode two. However, uh, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna call this episode, Protect Thy House. Uh, I am your host, I am Matt Scott, and I am also the National Sales Manager here at Conduct Industries for Critical Infrastructure. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, just laying it down, I guess uh, better part of a decade I spent in the Marines from 2nd LAR Battalion to 3-6 as well as a uh, combat instructor, got out and uh, went upon and Lived the, uh, the dream roughly as a uh, defense contractor for a, a little bit as, a, as well as an assistant combat instructor and uh, then landed here. Um, I am also uh, able to go ahead and say uh, welcome Mr. Chase Tobin. So I'm Chase Tobin. Um, <laughs> I'm the National Sales Manager of Law Enforcement, Security, and Force Protection here at Contact Industries. A uh, little background about myself. I was also in the Marines. Uh, I was a grunt Marine uh, with FATS companies out of Norfolk, and I was also in 2-4 out of Cal uh, Camp Pendleton. Uh, when I got done with the Marines, did five years active, a little bit of reserve time. Um, found myself in some healthcare, uh, the healthcare industry, doing security work there, uh, as well as academia before I was uh, kind of discovered by Contact. And now I'm actually really stoked to be here and and help support this mission. Uh, like Matt said, this, uh, this podcast is Complacency Kills. Our, kind of our goal is to bring to the forefront this discussion about um, force protection strategies you know, from a, a macro to a micro level, how it's gonna affect you uh, in your business or your home. So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, what we're gonna be going on today. So with that, let's get started. How you All doing, right. Matt? I am, uh, I am phenomenal. How are you doing? I'm good, man, I'm good. Okay. Well, what are we talking about today specifically? Uh, you know, let's protect the house, so what we got? Protect Thy House is really targeted on something that is obviously near and dear to our hearts. Right. Uh, right. Should be to everyone in the defense community, and more importantly, everyone that's you know here living in U.S. abroad, everything. Um, so we're, talk, we're, we're talking uh, the term we use in the industry is target hardening. Yeah. We can use so, and force protection, target hardening are, are similar concepts, but they're uh, they're different at the same time. Um, like I said, with, with the target hardening, uh, in, in our space, we deal with uh, your, your market specifically is the, uh, the critical infrastructure. Correct. Um, and the market that I target mostly, it's state and local governments, uh, police departments, uh, municipal buildings, et cetera. Um, but we want to take kind of this uh, funnel approach today, I think. Uh, I think that's how we want to go. And we can do this a couple different ways. We can either go, you know, small to big or big to small, and we'll figure that out in a minute. Um, of how it affects you know the, your your overall security plan down to the individual. Right. Uh, I think I think that's how we should go, but I, I don't know how you want to do it. Well, I think more importantly, that everyone should understand is from big to small. Okay. I mean, because everyone sees that that small picture. You know, where do I lie in today's avenue of approach of getting not necessarily hit, but also getting hit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I I know target hardening uh, again is near and dear to the hearts especially what's going on in today's time as of right now. Right. With Current events play a big role in a lot of this stuff, and we'll get into that a little bit more um, as we go forward with the discussion. Uh, but it is, it is important to keep that in mind and keep a couple things in mind as we move forward. There's always two questions that I like to address. If I'm, if I'm going on a site walk, if you're going on a site walk, and we're talking to the security manager, the, the patrol captain, whoever, whoever the building manager might be, always two questions I like to ask them uh, to get their, their minds uh, kind of rolling, right? Uh, the first one is, what if blank happens? What if X event happens? Whatever it might be. Everybody always, their mind always jumps to active shooter, uh, so we can use that as, as the, the, the go-to example. But what if this event happens? And the second question is, how do I survive X event? Right. Right. So if you can, if you can keep those two questions in mind as we move through this whole uh, discussion today, I think it'll help out uh, the viewers and listeners uh, really get a grasp of it. Well, that. I think those parameters are, are good to set in place, and mm -hmm. I think that we should start off with the basic how tos or how dos or do nots. Uh, but more importantly, like from the general perspective, the one question I need to ask you mm -hmm. now, I know from my experience what target hardening is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joe Schmo, that's walking on, on the streets as of right now, does he know what target hardening is? Uh, we know that the defense specialists, they, they know what it is, but uh, could you, being the, uh, the specialist that you are, especially in target hardening and force protection, could you give us a good definition and whatnot 
uh, what target hardening truly is. Yeah, I mean, in, in layman's terms, your, your target hardening is your physical, physical security measures. What do you do to mitigate um, threats? as it were, and this can be anything from ballistic glass to armor plating, uh, barriers, bollards, crash gates, etc. cetera, um, like the actual physical uh, uh, structures that we can put into place to stop something bad from happening, right? Um, but it's also a little bit more than that, too, and that's more the target hardening. Then you get into the force protection side of it. Uh, it can also be your camera systems. It can be your landscape, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, your landscape design, uh, and then your, your best practices of uh, the personnel in your office or your facility or whatever it might be. All those are integral and they all come together in this kind of mosaic uh, tapestry, if you will, of, uh, of force protection, right? Um, if your people get into a routine, they get into a, into a rut, they get complacency, and as we know, complacency kills. That's why we have this podcast. We wanted to get you, uh, get you thinking. Right. Uh, always, always about security, not that you're paranoid, but that you always have an idea of what's going on around you. It's that situational awareness, so... Um, that would be my definition. I, was, I know I kind of ran on a little bit, but... No, 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 no. <laughs> you, you, you're completely fine. And I think that everyone should understand the definition. However, a lot of people don't understand the importance right. of it. Right. And uh, again, you know, you want to you really uh, point out the average citizen because the average citizen lives and br- does everything from top to bottom, you know, living in munis- or municipalities, uh, like you have the, the experience of embassies. Mm-hmm. You have the experience of uh, healthcare facilities. Mm-hmm. You have the experience of, uh, excuse me, uh, universities. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, if, if you can go ahead and just touch on the importance, because, I mean, when, when parents send their, their kids to universities, mm-hmm. uh, do they know what's really out there? I mean, granted, they have security guards out there, but mm-hmm. what are the security guards protected from? Right. Uh, when they send uh, their kids out to school, you know, j- j- just their basic schools, w- whether it be uh, kindergarten schools or whatnot, mm-hmm. however you say, um, what, how are they protected? Yeah, so I mean, if you start, again, if we work kind of big to small, uh, when I worked in the Marines, I was part of the FAST teams. And FAST teams, we um, were kind of a crisis response team. You know, they used to, they recruited me telling me I was the, the SWAT team of the Marine Corps. It wasn't that high speed. Um, <laughs> but um, we did a lot of embassy work. So after Benghazi happened in, uh, in 2012, or yeah, 20, 2013 is when Benghazi happened, right? Because I was, yeah, I was in school at that time. So Benghazi happened. Uh, my particular unit, not me personally, my platoon, but my unit went to the embassy in Tripoli and reinforced it uh, to prevent follow-on attacks. That was uh, the unit I was, to give you an idea of what that is. Um, so with an embassy, embassy is your, it's like a fortress, right? You've got, you've already got all the access control, you've got the ECPs, you've got barriers, uh, you've got your control points uh, with, with vehicles and p- pedestrian traffic. Um, we did a training exercise at the Romanian embassy uh, back when I was in, and we just set up a drill as if we were getting overrun by, uh, by terrorists, right? But our job was to take what they already had, augment it with you know, machine gun fire, sea wire, um, p- uh, roving patrols, static patrols, et cetera, to help uh, increase that security posture and work with the guys on the ground to do that. Um, also, with our site security exercises that we would do, we would pretend that we'd go to an embassy that didn't have any walls, and we'd have to set up some kind of defensive perimeter. Uh, so the, the important things is you got to always think about how am I going to keep my, my personnel, my property, my assets safe with whatever I've got. Whether, again, if, if it was sea wire and I had to build my own wall out of sea wire and ultimately HESCO barriers and stuff as it moves in, or uh, if I've already got an, a well-established embassy like the one in Iraq, it's got a mortar, a mortar canopy on top, right? Mortar-proof ceilings. But as we've seen, even those can get overrun sometimes. How does it happen? Is it complacency? Is it, it what's going on there? Um, Kind of moving down the list a little bit when we're talking about healthcare. Um, if you're in a healthcare facility, most, um, I guess, the, um, the biggest point of friction is that emergency department because you never know what's going to walk through the door. I was a security officer, a security lead in a, at a hospital up in New Jersey. Um, wasn't a trauma center, so it wasn't as crazy as it could have been, but I can only imagine uh, that, reception, uh, that reception worker. Uh, having to intake these patients not knowing what's about to walk through, through the door. And those doors have to stay open because ambulance have to get in there really fast. Um, people have to come in. You know, people have babies. People are coming in there strung out. They're drunk. Uh, you may have, have had a domestic dispute or something like that. Right. And you have to, both parties at the same hospital. So there's a lot of friction that can come in there. Um, so when you're thinking in healthcare, how do I secure that? And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But these are things just to kind of think about right. uh, in your in – your, um, in your day-to-day operation, right? So, now you say day-to-day, day-to-day operations. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and roll back and uh, from my experience. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so just 
going out in the middle of nowhere, uh, so to speak, and just setting up camp, especially in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. I know that the, the, the main goal is obviously to uh, clear, uh, set up mm -hmm. as quickly as possible, and begin operations. Mm -hmm. However, to do that, you need obviously to retain those four walls. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the three main goals is obviously deter, delay, and defend. Mm -hmm. um, now, my, my question to you, I mean, for uh, obviously the average citizen, now we, we know from critical infrastructure down to police departments, down to military installations, government facilities, uh, can anyone practice target hardening? Yeah. The, the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, from John Q. Citizen to uh, the head of you know, site operations at a nuclear site, you're, you should always be thinking how, you know, again, going back to those two questions, what if and how can I? What if this happens, how can I survive, right? Um, uh, the individual goal, again, is to address those, uh, those questions and figure out how, again, we preserve life overall, you know, uh, property and assets. Um, because, again, with the critical infrastructure right. side, that's important. You can't have that get destroyed because then power grids go out, right? On a military establishment, if, you, if it gets overrun, we've got serious problems of property getting get taken and stuff, right? So that's, that's uh, what you always have to think about. Uh, and even down to John Q. Citizen, am I locking my doors at night? Am I locking my car at night? That's simple target hardening force protection procedures. And like I said, we'll, we'll get on that a little bit, uh, a little bit farther on. Even, even if you're thinking about um, your storefront, right? If, if I'm a shop owner, as we've seen with what's going on in the world today, uh, Bricks go through glass pretty easily, right? right? Are there things we can do to stop that from happening? Yes. It's called security film. You can put that on there and the brick won't go through. It might shatter the glass a little bit, but it's going to keep it intact and it's going to keep people out. Same thing if you're a, a citizen, having a dog in your, back, in your backyard is another type of target hardening. It can, be, it can deter something from happening. Um, we talked about landscape earlier, right? right. There's a term in, uh, in law enforcement called crime prevention through environmental design, SEPTED for short. Right? This is how you uh, may have aggressive vegetation like sticker bushes to keep it under your windows to keep it from crawling through your windows. You may have uh, lighting on your house to illuminate your vehicles. You couple that with a camera. Now you've got all night long, you've got lights on your vehicles and you've got a camera on your vehicles. That's a huge deterrent. People who are up to no good after dark are generally uh, opportunists. They're not going to come into somewhere that looks pretty well fortified and, uh, and attack that facility. Right? Yeah. right? Um, so that's kind of a kind of sept head. And then into something we talked about schools earlier, right? Um, everybody always jumps to active shooter when we talk about a school, but that's not necessarily the most common thing you're going to see at a school. Most common thing you might see, at, especially a high school, right. kids just learning how to drive, and there's pedestrians all over the place, and we know kids like to be on their phone and they text, right? It's just minor vehicle collisions. How do you mitigate that, right? Now, now this is to go on to the schools, the healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, everything and anything. And mm -hmm. I know in, in pointing in the right direction, uh, a lot of these uh, facilities, a lot of these owners and whatnot, they really want to stay focused on a clean look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, because aesthetically pleasing, everybody wants to stay, you know, I'm new, I'm hip. Um, and I know that from facades, flower pots, bollards, mm -hmm. fencing, you know, it, it can all look good. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, what is your experience on kind of implementing that, that clean look to, let's say, police departments, let's say schools? I mean, because, you know, we really transferred from, you know, that, that, that old slim look from, hey, it's kind of a, <laughs> a prison system type look on a school versus mm -hmm. now. I mean, it, you go into a, a kindergarten school and it's a clean look. How, however, you know, do they know to really implement target hardening. Right, it's kind of a form versus function right. discussion, right? Um, the question, the answer to the question is yes, you can have uh, both form and function, but you kind of have to do that on the uh, the original build, generally speaking. So then now we get into a, a retrofit versus a, an original build scenario, right? A lot of places right now are thinking retrofit. It's, it's gonna be cheaper, obviously. Um, and you might have inherited a building, a storefront, a school, what have you. But now we're going to start upgrading the infrastructure, uh, the, physical the physical security infrastructure, right, um, versus the original build. Now, how do you get an original build uh, to uh, address form and function? Well, you have to start and talk with the architects. And something we've had a little success with it here at Contact is we've uh, uh, developed a lunch and learn program 
uh, with architectural firms that we go down and sit down with them and show them, hey, here's some options that you can put on the table for when you're designing a, a school, a building, a police department, what have you, that will uh, address the, uh, the threats that might be in the air, the, the expected threats, but also keep it aesthetic. Check out this. I don't know if, if they can see it on the camera or not, but this court bench right here uh, behind me, right, it looks like any other courtroom. Those are ballistic panels. You would never know it. Just looking at it, that's aesthetic, right? No, it's this behind you, the uh, police. Same thing with the police station behind me. If you, again, if you can see that, this whole uh, facade here just looks like regular doors, but that's a, a mag-locked um, mag door that uh, you have to either badge in. Um, that one's actually got a key, or you can be buzzed in from the inside, right? All that's ballistic glass. And then you've got some bollards. I would have placed those bollards a little differently, but that's a discussion for later. But you, 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 still, got the, you still got the storefront. Right. Uh, and it's ballistic, but it's still aesthetic. And it lets you know, clearly, this is, this is the police, right? Um, so th again, the answer is, uh, you have to have that conversation on the front end if you're, gonna, if you're gonna build from the ground up with your architect. If I'm building a new police department, if I'm building a house or anything like that, you can, you can ask these questions. And if they don't know, there are plenty of resources out there to bring in to, to help you uh, address your threats. Somebody like us, that's what we do. We have to do our threat, of vulner threat and vulnerability assessment. Sometimes police departments will do that for you too. Um, I, I think you're hitting this hard on the head mm -hmm. exactly where we need to go and we're really starting to funnel down to the individual mindset of you know let, let's say a, a person's home mm -hmm. um, and I, I know that I feel comfortable in, in my home mm -hmm. uh, yes I just have a, a standard security system yes mm -hmm. I have just a, a fence on, on the outside but with recent tensions and whatnot mm -hmm. building up especially in today's society what's happening now mm -hmm. um, is there uh, suitable way and or solution to protect myself and my family. And, and again, when, when doing this, this is also going to be applied to police departments, mm -hmm. also going to be applied to courtroom security, also going to be applied to nuke plants, uh, Department of Energy sites, government facilities, mm -hmm. um, and, and staying on that, that focused mindset, but really going down to the ind individual perspective, how do they do their own? I think to really address that, um Again, there's a lot packed into that question, but if you start at the top and work your way down again, ultimately we all want a, a castle with a moat and sharks with freaking laser beams, right? That's, that's ultimately what we all want at our, at our homes to, right protect, on. For, to, to protect people, right? That's, that's really that's what a, we, that's what what I like we to hear. want. Um, but obviously that's not re really realistic unless you live out in the middle of nowhere and you can afford a castle and a moat and sharks with laser beams. Um, if you find that, let me know. I will come. I'll be your butler, man. That's cool. <laughs> um, but something as simple as even having like a ring doorbell or one of these, you know, uh, video doorbells. Those are awesome. It's a deterrent because you can see who's coming to your house before you even get there, even when you're not home, right, without having a really uh, super expensive security system, which those are awesome because a lot of those tie into the police and rapid response and all that stuff, but that's an another discussion. Um, but when it comes to the home, it, I think it comes down to practice, best practices within your home. Um, every night before I, I go to bed, uh, when I'm starting to get the kids down, I'll put them in their bed, and I do what I call my safety checks. I go down, I make sure my uh, car doors are locked, I make sure the lights are on outside the house, and I make sure all the interior doors are locked. Very simple. That's, gonna, it's, it's, it, that's just a deterrent measure. Right. Um, and it, you can check your local uh, police reports and things like that, but generally speaking, uh, people wander around at night, they're opportunists, they're not going to come, uh, if you've got a fence around your house, again, this is your perimeter, right? Uh, we haven't really talked about perimeter that much, we'll get to that in a little bit, but... Um, a fence is a deterrent. I'm not going to want to jump a fence in the middle of the night when I can't see what's on the other side. What if there's a dog? What if there's hostile vegetation? There's a lot of things that they're going to take the path of least resistance. A lot of, in, in my area, a lot of people just, they're going, they're, they're checking doors. If the door is unlocked to your car at night, they'll rummage through it. If they find something, cool. If they don't, they keep going. It's not, it's entering. It's not really breaking because your door's unlocked. So if me as the individual just lock my doors, it prevents, a, it mitigates a lot of that threat already. Right. right. I think, uh, again, you hit it on the head, but mitigation mm -hmm. uh, is, is key. It really mm -hmm. helps the, uh, obviously, uh, defending your house, your, your facility, your building, your business. Um, delay features, obviously, perimeter security. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially, you hit it again, fencing. And you, and you do a lot of perimeter security with the nuke sites, right? Tell me, tell me what, what, what is your experience in that, I guess? What do you do on the nuke sites? Uh, I mean, the, the, the preventive measures that, you know, nuke sites take is... Uh, one on one ratio is probably ultimately the, the best I, I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they have some of the best fencing, the best 
uh, access that you can possibly think of. Mm -hmm. um, fencing, uh, realistically speaking, is you're not you're not going to get in. You're not going to get in, and uh, what we've assisted with is really preventative measures to stop anyone from getting in. Um, and it gets back to that de delay, detect, uh, defend correct. Uh, principle we talked about earlier. Um, you set your, you know, if you're thinking of security zones, right, my perimeter is the front line, right? <laughs> and, and ultimately, we want to have that perimeter as far out as possible. And if you have a fence and you can channel the fence somehow and, and have the enemy or your threat come into where you've got your, your camera systems, your detection systems or whatever. Again, uh, people being, you know, following the path of least resistance, if you can channel them, you've set up defenses, right? right. You're, you're a mortarman. You dug, you, well, you, I don't know, I don't know how much, uh, I'm not, that's another discussion for another day, but you, 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 you dug a hole. Let's not go there, boy. Let's yeah, not go there. I'm sitting in a fighting hole and, and the mortar guys are back there <laughs> laying, uh, hanging out just playing spades, right? But, um, uh, you set up your perimeter as far out, and you set up your, your, your wire uh, system so you channel the enemy into where you want them, right? Right. The, the point of the perimeter is to uh, keep people out, but if they are going to get in, you can, you can funnel them where they need to be. Correct. Um, uh, and especially with, with new sites, mm -hmm, they, mm -hmm. they have that opportunity that they funnel, uh, strategically funnel the enemies and or the threat mm -hmm. to a vulnerable uh, position where they can go ahead and then take them down. Right, and then they're covered with, with a, a, a weapon system of some kind. Correct. Whether it's a, a precision rifle or a machine, a and machine gun or whatever. I mean, from perimeter security, we're not just talking about fencing. Right. We're talking about turnstiles. Mm -hmm. We're talking about barriers. Right. Uh, again, gates, uh, swing our gates. Uh, there's seven different uh, variations of perimeter security that one of the nuke sites use, however, also the Department of Energy sites, government facilities, mm -hmm. uh, military mm -hmm. installations, you know, having just a simple post out there is mm -hmm. going to be a preventative measure. And that's the beauty of what we do uh, with contact. That's why I love this job so much. I get excited talking about it. Is we take that same technology that we do protecting critical infrastructure assets, and we apply that to state, local, uh, federal government facilities, right? So if you're if you're looking at uh, a police department who may not have a good fence around their motor pool, right? We can put a, a good fence around there, keep you from coming in and smashing windows on, on a police car. Right. If you're looking at a um, a council chamber for your your town hall or your city council, um, we can install ballistic glass in in there and you know keep shots from coming in. Or we can put like we did in this court bench here. Um, you put the uh, ballistic panels behind the existing infrastructure, and it's and it's a, a, you know saves you money, but it also uh, protects people that need to be protected. Uh, if you're talking about hospitals again, how do I how do I harden up a hospital and keep it aesthetic? Same kind of principle. You hide it. <laughs> you, you hide the stuff, right? right? You put it behind the existing infrastructure, and you can put armor paneling behind your, um, your receptionist. And if something bad does happen, they just duck. Real easy. Funny, funny story, right? I walk into a, um, on a site walk at a police station uh, not that long ago, um, and it was a converted bank. And they took the ballistic glass out of the uh, teller windows at the drive-in, uh, whether you drive through. They bricked it and they took that ballistic glass and they put it in the reception area. And I walk in and talk to a nice little lady there and uh, she welcomed me and I was getting ready to have a meeting. And I was just kind of looking around. And I said, you know, it's ballistic glass. That, that's good. She goes, yeah, we you know, told me it was a bank and everything. And I said, well, what have you got underneath, you know, where your desk is? Because, you know, it was like a window with a, with a talk box. And underneath it was like a facade. I was like, is this ballistic too? She looked, kind of looked at me kind of puzzled and I was like... Ma'am, you, unless you're Spider-Man and can jump up on the ceiling and, sh and if shots were to come <laughs> through here, they're going to hit the ballistic glass, but nothing's going to stop it at the bottom. Right. Right. So, again, this is things you got to think about when you're incorporating your total security plan, right? right? Agreed. If we're going to jump into the universities, uh, again, working at a university, the, the perimeter, a lot of them have fencing around them, and they have, uh, at their entries, they have a guard post, depending on the universe, private versus public, depending on what's going on. But some of them will have, have the security posts, and they can be very aesthetic. we got... We got bollards that you wouldn't even know that they're bollards. It looks like a little statue, but it'll stop a Mack truck, right? Uh, if you go to a, a public venue like a stadium, a lot of times you'll see around the outside, you'll see benches and you'll see planters, these big planters with flowers and stuff, and they look beautiful. But they're but again, strategically, but they're strategically in placed in play. right. to stop a Mack truck, right? Another funny story, and you can, you can jump in whenever you want to. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm at, I'm at a, a convention, right? And uh, we stopped to get gas and went in to, you know, get a drink or whatever. And we noticed the bollards, right? So bollards are vehicle mitigation barriers, right? And they're placed every, you know, at every um, parking space. So you can't pull your car into, you know, the building, 
right? So the bollard will stop. Well, bollards are supposed to be placed every four to five feet, right? And the, you put bollards in place because every 52 seconds, some body drives to a storefront, right? It happens. It's just the, 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 it's just, it's just a statistic, right? Um, so that's what the bollards are for. So the bollards are placed right in, in, in every uh, parking space. Then there's the, the front, the store window. So the double doors. And in front of the double doors are shaded handicap zones where you unload and unload stuff. And there's no bollards. So I could just drive a truck right through, the, right through the front window. And they've got all these beautiful bollards everywhere, but not where they need them, them the most. Correct. So, again, when you're planning your design, you've got to... You've got to think, and you've got to uh, adjust, and you've got to incorporate these strategies, but in a way that makes sense. That's why you call us. Okay. So we went over, well, let's just hit it, the five W's. We went over yep. the what, the who, the why. Uh, really what we want to go ahead and really stick to but is when. When. That's the question, right? Ideally, you don't want to play catch up. We go back to those two questions. What if X happens? How do I survive? If you're in this uh, scenario and you've mapped out everything, you really thought about it, your goal is to, so if your event's here, boom, X event. A brick smashing through your window, that's your X event, all right? Instead of um, the brick going through the window and you, you know, guy gets arrested or whatever, he leaves and, and runs off and goes to police, now you have to replace your ballistic, or not your, not your, your storefront glass, right. right? Maybe on the front end, I've already put some kind of security film up. I've already put some kind of, um, you know, in, in, if X event is a vehicle running through your uh, storefront or your police department, and, and not that long ago in, in a town near me, uh, they had a, a guy, not malicious, yeah, I think he might have actually been drunk, but he, he smashed his car right through the front of a fire station. They had no vehicle mitigation, no bollards, no barriers, nothing, right? Um, that was the, the, the bang event. So we want to operate left of bang before it happens. We want to be preemptive. Instead, uh, 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 proactive, I should say, rather than reactive. Because if you're playing reactive, now you're playing playing catch up. You know, we, we talk in the current state of affairs right now. There's you know riots and looting and things like that going on. If you kind of see this coming, just like with a hurricane, what do people do? They board up their windows. Now nobody knew this was going to happen. You know what's going on right now overnight. I mean, there were some tensions and stuff building. I get it, but this stuff popped up all over the place. Um, but Seeing these things coming, what you can do in your own uh, neighborhood is you can put boards up, or before it happens, you think, okay, next time, have some kind of security film, have some kind of vehicle mitigation. Put your perimeter out a little bit farther to keep people from getting in uh, to your area. And again, that gets back into the whole retrofit versus original build design. Have I inherited this structure, or am I going ahead and build it from the ground up with these things in mind? Um, and that's with the architects and everything. Um, and we love to talk to architects. They love it when we, when we show up. We sit down, we have a conversation with them. These guys are like, man, I didn't even know anything about right. tactics, right? And that's where we can we, – it's so cool because we get to take our knowledge and our you know, experience in, uh, from the, the Marine Corps and, and beyond and apply that and keep people safe. That's what we do. We keep people safe. Now, obviously, uh, anyone who's watching this can see that you're very passionate. Not, I'm very passionate. Uh, again, you know, I'm this, talking this, too fast. My bad. No, no, no. no. <laughs> But this episode is obviously near and dear to our hearts. And mm -hmm. like I said before, uh, in, in the defense community, and uh, uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Mm -hmm. um, but what I want to go ahead and do and just hit on, again, the importance, you know, the, the overall knowledge, you know, the, the preparedness and uh, the vulnerability. You know, target hardening is obviously a, a key component of just survival in general. Mm -hmm. um, and with that being said, do uh, you have any closing statements? I think the, the biggest thing just to take away from all this is to start the conversation. If you're concerned about your security posture, where do you want to put If you're concerned about those five W's, you know, the biggest one is how we can help you uh, do that here at Contact, right? Uh, we can answer all those questions. Where Most people are just thinking, where do I put this? Where do I start? Correct. Right. Ask the question. Talk to, talk to us. Talk to your, you can talk to your local PD. You can, you can give us a call. And we'd be more than happy to have a site visit and help you at least understand the threats that might be around, your best practices. Because a lot of times these things can be put in place and you won't even have to spend a dime. It may be just, you know, at a school you've got a, a, a dumpster area. It looks real nice, keeps the garbage cans in. But unless you put a padlock in it, a vagrant could, could uh, have that as a shelter, right? And, you know, uh, you know, obviously we want to take care of people, but a lot of people don't want a vagrant in, in, their, in their garbage can. So 
boom, there you go. Put a padlock. Real easy. At a school, you can put bollards up to keep you from getting hit as they're, you know, brand new drivers. A lot of things you can do that, that won't even, um, that won't even cost you a dime. Um, and we can help you do that by just looking at practices. How am I sitting? Right now we're sitting facing uh, the door. We can see everything that's coming in right now. Was that by design? I think, I think so. We're, we're always paying attention. Um, the biggest thing is situational awareness too. So ask the question, always stay vigilant, and uh, you know, don't be afraid to act if something does happen, right? Okay. All right. Well, uh, Chase, thank you uh, for all your knowledge as well as education on hey, this, uh, on this too, topic. Man. Uh, for one, I just want to say thank you for everyone for tuning in to this episode. This is Protect Thy House uh, again, and this is uh, Contact Industries Podcast Channel. This is Complacency Kills. So yeah. please uh, tune in for the next episode, and uh, we'll get back at you. Take care.